Welcome to First Friday. I trust that you can all hear me. We have an interesting uh, situation where our wonderful MC is not quite available for us. So welcome to a wonderful First Friday. Uh, we're all enjoying the fact that there's rain out there. Uh, a little respite from the fire fears and Tonight we have a wonderful presentation by Jim Caldwell, a local expert on art in general, but especially on John Singer Sargent. So we are lucky enough to be um, speaking and listening to him. And um, <laughs> I think now would be a good time for Jim to start speaking. Okay. Thanks, Corinne. So um, thanks for, for joining us tonight. And I, um, I, I really enjoyed talking about Sargent, so I hope you'll, you'll enjoy this. Um, so I need to do a little screen share here. And, um, and we'll get started here. So I'm a painter, and if I had to pick a favorite artist among my favorites, it would certainly be John Singer Sargent. Born in Florence to American expatriates on January 12, 1856, Sargent was 16 years younger than his future painting companion, Claude Monet, and three years younger than Vincent van Gogh. His fame and reputation quickly grew upon his extraordinary skill as a portraitist, but he was also supremely talented as a landscape painter, a watercolorist, and a muralist. In the next 45 minutes, I will give you a glimpse of the depth and breadth of his extraordinary talent. In his prolific 50-year career, he produced more than 900 paintings, at least 600 of which were portraits, mostly full size, and over 2,000 watercolors. Here he is standing in his studio, standing in, the, in front of the infamous Madame X. It's fascinating that he's painting, not in a smock, but in a formal cutaway coat and tie, with shiny black shoes. Sergeant's father, Fitzwilliam, had been a successful eye surgeon in Philadelphia when his daughter died. His disconsolate wife, Mary, persuaded him to give up his practice and move to Florence to recover from this terrible tragedy. It was there that John Singer Sargent was born. Singer was his mother's maiden name. This exquisite drawing of the Swiss Alps, which Sargent did when he was only 13, shows us that he had an innate patience and dexterity to carefully lay down the complicated landscape before him. Notice the depth which he has created with a simple variation in line weight or the amount of pressure he puts on the pencil. To say that Sargent was precocious would be a significant understatement. He did this beautiful watercolor a year later when he was only 14. Watercolor is a difficult medium, and he had already mastered it. I have not seen it documented, but I think Sargent had a photographic memory, which would help to explain his innate ability to record complicated visual information in his mind and put it to paper. His father wrote, my boy John seems to have a strong desire to be an artist by profession, a painter. He shows so much evidence of talent in that direction and takes so much pleasure in cultivating it that we have concluded to gratify him and to keep that plan in view in his studies. How lovely it is to be supported in an artistic career by one's father, unlike Monet and Van Gogh, as you may have heard me talk about before. Four years later, the Sargent family had moved to Paris, considered at that time to be the center of the world's best art education. John was enrolled in the studio of Emile Auguste Durand. This is Sargent's portrait of his teacher. Durand was a leading portraitist whose radical te teaching techniques allowed his students to paint immediately rather than the endless classical drawing studies of the École des Beaux-Arts. He encouraged his students to study the Spanish master, Diego Velazquez, whose freshness and power had an obvious impact on the young Sargent, who became Durand's protege. Early on, Sargent recognized the financial significance of portrait commissions. 
Sargent did this beautiful homage to a te his teacher when he was only 23. It was a critical and popular success at the 1879 Salon, that huge annual art show in Paris. This was already Sargent's third Salon success. How unusual it must have been for the master to sit for his student. Clearly, Durant recognized that Sargent had a very special talent. Look at the unusual off-balance pose, the exquisite hands in their unusual positions, the brilliant white cuffs, the intensity of the gaze, the little red accent, accent of the Légion d'honneur insignia on the Dur, on Durant, Durant's lapel, and the handkerchief peeking out of his breast pocket. When Sargent was 20, he took his first brief trip to the US to establish his citizenship, accompanied by his mother and sister. He remained close to his family and gave them financial support later on in his career. As Sargent's reputation as a portraitist grew, along with his success at the Salon, he began to travel more in Europe and he added genre paintings or scenes of ordinary life to his repertoire. I've always loved this one, a scene on the Brittany coast painted numerous times by Monet, whom he had met at the second Impressionist show when Sargent was 20. It has Monet's sunny palette and beautiful sky reflecting the glistening white, reflected in the glistening white sand, wet sand. But Sargent has a much better grasp of human anatomy and the six backlighted figures are much more dramatic than Monet's. This painting is only four feet wide, yet each of the figures has her own personality. Sargent is also playing with negative spaces. Negative space is a term I will use several more times in this talk. It is a space left over or around or in between an object. In this case, the legs and figures and can be interesting in itself. When he was 23, Sargent traveled to Madrid to study Velasquez firsthand and on to Morocco, where he when he returned to Paris, he painted this huge eight foot by 11 foot tour de force based on this, his, the studies he did, did there. El Haleo means chorus, and we can almost hear the musicians singing. Sargent was a risk taker, and this is such a daring painting with, a lar with its large areas of black shadow and bold composition. Notice the beautiful left hand of the flamenco dancer who looks like she might fall over backwards the hands of the musicians, the gorgeous folds of the dancer's white skirt, the splash of red on the far right, the two shiny guitars hanging on the blank wall, and the shadows of the dancer and the musicians cast on the wall by the footlights. I've known and admired this painting since Williams College. Inspired by his trip to Morocco, it shows a fine grasp of architecture and Moorish details with perfect perspective. His pale palette of white on white is so different than the dark and mysterious El Haleo, yet equally romantic as this woman inhales the smoke of the ambergris from the incense burner. Note the richness of the colors in the Persian carpet and the flecks of the hot colors in the woman's robe. Sargent has su such a fine sense of drama with most of the painting being quite plain in contrast to the richness of the robe under her hood. Sargent preferred painting portraits of his friends as they gave him much more artistic license. One of his most critically acclaimed early portraits was this full-size one of his friend, Charlotte Louise Bouchard, which he showed at the 1882 Salon along with El Haleo. Charlotte's mother desperately wanted to have Sargent as a son-in-law, but it was not to be. The portrait was a tribute to Velazquez with its monochromatic palette, except for the beautiful red lips, its emphasis on the silhouette and the shallow space. His friend, the writer Henry James wrote of, his, wrote of this painting, it offers the slightly uncanny spectacle of a talent which on the very threshold of its career has nothing more to learn. It's not simply precocity in the guise of maturity, it is the freshness of youth combined with the artistic experience really felt and assimilated of generations." Unquote. As, was, as we have seen in the last painting, Sargent has already mastered that complicated piece of anatomy, the hand. 
We feel that we know this young girl. And by our expression, we can guess that her feet are tired and she is bored with being Sergeant's model. The delicacy of the fine black tulle and the cuffs of the dress is stunning. That same year, when Sergeant was only 27, he met the Louisiana-born Amélie Gautreau, wife of a Parisian banker, of a prominent Parisian banker. Amélie was trying to make a name for herself in Paris society. The two images will be explained in a moment. Sergeant was immediately fascinated by her eccentric beauty. He wrote to a friend, I have a great desire to paint her portrait and have reason to think that she would allow it and is waiting for someone to propose this homage to her beauty. You might tell her that I am a man of prodigious talent. She readily agreed, but Sargent struggled to find the right pose for his sitter and made numerous oil and charcoal studies. In one of the endless sittings, or should I say standings, one jeweled strap slipped off her shoulder and Sargent knew instantly that it would be the distinguishing feature of the portrait. He worked on the portrait for over a year and he assumed that it would be a breakthrough for his and her reputation at the 1884 Salon. As usual, Sargent was taking a big risk with the daring decolletage, the striking profile, the lavender powder makeup, and the jeweled strap falling off the right shoulder, a scandalous image for the French audience of 1884. Seen in the black and white image on the left, it was a succès to scandal, and it was immediately criticized ex as exceeding the bounds of decorum, even as it was surround as even as it was surrounded by numerous classical nudes. Nude was acceptable, but naked was not. Was this a prelude to sex? As was the custom, it was it was titled Portrait de Madame X to protect her identity, but of course, no one seeing the portrait failed to recognize her. Amelie was extremely distraught by the public reaction. And after the show, Sargent repainted the shoulder strap as seen on the right. Much to his surprise, it was at least temporarily, temporarily disastrous to his reputation as well. One critic wrote, this portrait is simply offensive in its insolent ugliness and defiance of every rule of art, unquote. Because of the scandal, Amelie went into hiding and Sargent moved to London. Of course, Gautreau, the Gautreau family would not buy the portrait, which had not been commissioned, and Sargent kept it displayed in his studio until he sold it to the Metropolitan Museum 32 years later. Just before he sold it, he said to a friend, I suppose, suppose it is the best thing I have ever done. It's considered by many to be his best portrait for its innovative twisted pose the drama of her profile and the delicacy of her features and the complex psychological depiction of the arrogance of the Paris society in the Belle Epoque. Because of this scandal, London would become Sargent's home base for the rest of his life, much to the, the delight of his friend, Henry James. Sargent's reputation recovered, Amelie's tragically did not. Now that we have dispensed with the scandal of Madame X, stay with me for the rest of Sargent's brilliant career. As a direct response to this scandal, Sargent chose two young girls for his next subject. He spent considerable amount of time in the Cotswolds where he painted this beautiful piece, with this, which is another one of my favorites. He named it after a refrain from a popular song and it so beautifully illustrates the precious innocence of youth. It's a stunning tour de force of colors, textures, pattern, and light. The girls pose for weeks every afternoon, just after sunset, that magic time of day we call dusk, so that Sargent could record the contrast between the fading daylight and the glowing candlelight. He captures it perfectly. Let's go in for a closer look. Notice the warm glow on her face from the lantern on the left and the glow on the delicate hand which is lighting the candle, and the shape of the hand in the lower left, and the interesting negative spaces of the dark foliage in the background. As a reminder, negative space is that which is left over or around an object. This, is, this painting was displayed at the Royal Academy in 1887 and was immediately bought by the Tate Gallery. Shortly after he finished 
carnation lily lily rose, Sargent visited Monet at his new home in Giverny. He painted this charming little portrait of his friend with Alice Hoshide, Monet's second wife. It shows the impact that Impressionism had on Sargent and their commitment to painting outdoors or en plein air. The picture Monet is working on in this painting is identifiable as one which is now in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. When Sargent was 33, he showed six paintings in the American section of the 1889 Exposition Universelle in Paris. The French government awarded him a medal and gave him a Chevalier of the Légion d'Honneur. This was only five years after the scandal of Madame X. The early reticence of the British to commission Sargent portraits was not shared by the Americans, who were in no way scandalized by Madame X. In late 1887, he traveled to Newport for his first American commission. In the next six months, he had completed 20 portraits and his first one-man show in Boston. He was 32. He returned a year later and in 11 months, he had done 40 more as well as receiving a commission to do the murals of the new Boston Public Library, which we will come back to in a bit. This portrait of Madame Swinton, of Mrs. Swinton is seven and a half feet tall. We feel that we know this woman, this beautiful woman. I love the neutral background, which brings out the subtle flesh tones of her face and neck. It's curious that earrings were clearly out of fashion at the end of the 19th century. This detail of the same painting is why I love Sargent. He has captured the delicacy and warmth of her hot hand as it peeks out from one of the gauzy layers of her dress. But he paints the white satin with a quick flamboyant and seemingly careless dash of white with one of his biggest brushes. It takes supreme talent and confidence to do that. When your brush is loaded with pigment, it's impossible to know exactly how it will come out on the canvas. I call this a happy accident. And Sargent's paintings are full of them. The genius is knowing when to leave it and not overwork it. Soon there were commissions on both sides of the Atlantic and both sides of the English Channel. This one of Mrs. Hammersley is the wife of a British banker in a brilliant magenta velvet dress seated in a vivacious pose that suggests the influence of Impressionism. Again, we see Sargent's brilliant brushwork with detail where he needs it, the eyes, the nose, the mouth and loose broad strokes with his biggest brush where he doesn't. You can almost reach in and feel, feel the nap of the velvet. Let's look at a detail again. Sargent's treatment of the lace collar, the jewelry, and the background is breathtaking in its confidence and simplicity compared with the subtle sensitivity of her face. Again, lots of happy accidents in the lace collar. Sargent painted this portrait of the same, at the same time he was working on Madame X. Caroline, with her thin lips, was not a particularly beautiful woman, and certainly not all of the women Sargent was commissioned to paint were beautiful. But this is a beautiful portrait, and you can see it at the de Young Museum. Here is what a fifth grader in the Oakland School District had to say. Paint me with a white lace dress, shimmering in the light, Paint me with cream roses pinned in my hair and sewn in my dress. Paint me with a chocolate brown shawl and pearl earrings clipped in my ears. Paint me beautiful. Look at the ease with which he has painted the turquoise lining of the chocolate brown silk shawl compared with a delicate wedding band on the perfectly painted hand. Sargent was particularly brilliant with his family portraits, like this one of the three daughters of the Honorable Percy Wyndham, arranged with like huge white flowers on a sumptuous sofa. The size of this piece, seven feet by 10 feet, is truly impressive. Notice the white gardenias in the lower right, the splash of sunlight on the portrait of their mother watching over them from above, and the fact that the only one looking at the artist and us is the youngest of the three. Notice the beautiful hands, including the ones behind the back of the oldest sister, 
and the sparkly jeweled arm cuff of the daughter looking at us. Again, no earrings. There is a definite family resemblance, of course, but each of the girls has a distinct personality. We are left to ponder the relationship between the sisters. Sergeant revels in the psychological implications. The drama of this scene with its dark background is classic Sergeant. This is such an unusual and touching pose for, the, for a mother and her daughter, with Rachel's chin resting on her mother's shoulder this speaks volumes about their intimate relationship. Rachel is sitting on an armless chair at an angle to her mother's. Notice the contrast between the mother's conservative hairstyle and the daughter's untamed locks. Rachel's wistful gaze in contrast to her mother's serene one. Notice also Rachel's hand intertwined with her mother's arm, the beautiful white satin ribbon applied to the mother's dress and the splash of light reflecting off the shiny arm of the chair. When Sargent showed this portrait at the Society of American Artists, the New York Times called it the star of the show. Mr. Stokes appears in the painting only because their dog, a Great Dane, expected to pose for the painting was not available. Clearly, Mr. Stokes is the secondary figure. I love that the two figures are impossibly tall and skinny, their heads too small, and that she has oversized shoulder pads. Sargent painted her face nine times before he was satisfied, scraping the first eight down to the bare canvas. Notice the loving care he has taken to get her pleated shirt and straw hat just right. And who could not love this charming and fascinating portrait of the Watt daughters painted 20 years, 21 years earlier, a tribute to Velasquez's famous Las Meninas. The meaning of this enigmatic painting has puzzled art historians for centuries. Las Meninas means maids of honor. Granted that this was painted 230 years earlier and is a breakthrough masterpiece on a number of levels, I prefer the bold simplicity of the sergeant. Now, three of the four girls are looking at us and the oldest, the rebellious one is looking off into the darkness. The youngest plays with her doll on the floor. Notice how he has brilliantly played off the two huge shiny blue decorative Chinese urns against the bold splash of daylight on a dagger shaped red screen. Like the Velasquez painting, we are left to ponder the psychological relationship between the sisters. The white pinafores are set off dramatically against the mysterious inky darkness of the space beyond, similar to Las Meninas. And the suggestion of a window in the back is like the light coming from the doorway in the back of the Velasquez. The legs of the two older girls are only suggested by the light shining off their shiny black pat leather shoes. The square canvas, very unusual for the period, was also a tribute to Velasquez. The two giant urns were later donated to the Boston Museum where the painting hangs, and now they flank the painting. So far, I've concentrated on his beautiful women, but Sargent had numerous commissions of powerful men as well. I particularly like this grand portrait of Sir Frank Swintendam with his crisp white dress uniform in contrast with the rich warm colors of the fabric usually uh, casually draped over a piece of furniture. I love the shiny sword reflecting the light from his uniform, the right hand gripping never mind what, the multicolored metal pinned to his chest and the warm reflected light on the left sleeve. Sergeant was multilingual, a talented pianist, very well read and had many close friends but male, both male and female. But he was shy and very private about his personal life. Because he never married and because of portraits like this one of Dr. Posey in his brilliant red dressing gown, there was the inevitable speculation and rumors that he was homosexual. I particularly like Sargent's treatment of Dr. Posey's hands and the beaded slipper peeking out from under the robe. Then there was this provocative nude Sargent did many charcoal drawings of male nudes, but also this one. 
My guess is that Sargent was bisexual. He was certainly drawn to many beautiful women like Emily Gautreau and Charlotte Bouchard, Lady with a Rose, and Sargent's relationship with his female sitters, which often went on for many sittings, was understandably intimate. To complete the circle, Dr. Posey was said to have been one of Amelie's lovers. We can't leave his full-length portraits without looking at this dazzling tour de force. Sargent went to the opening night of Macbeth starring Dame Ellen Terry in 1888. She was wearing the spectacular crochet green dress set off by her long amber hair and was immediately inspired to paint her portrait. The dress was embroidered with gold and the fluttery blue flecks are incredibly 1000 iridescent wings from the real green jewel beetle. Here, her penetrating blue eyes, pale skin and sparkling gold crown are the finishing touches. Look at the reflections on the inside of the crown and the slightly parted lips. The portrait was exhibited on both sides of the Atlantic to great critical acclaim. Excuse me, I didn't, I didn't mean to, um, I didn't mean to do that. I'm gonna go back if I can. Oh, shoot. Well, I'm gonna go on. In 1907, Sargent was 51 and at the height of his, uh, the, at the height of his fame, he had been averaging 17 monumental portraits a year, charging at least 130,000 in today's dollars for each one. He had accumulated plenty of money and had grown understandably impatient with the taxing work of portraiture. So that year, he officially closed his portrait studio with the intent of focusing on the Boston Public Library murals and architectural and landscape subjects in watercolor, painted for pure personal pleasure without any intention of selling them. Of course, he made special portrait exemptions, as we shall see. But before we look at his brilliant watercolors, let's look at a few of the many beautiful portrait drawings he made. Some of the drawings are the studies for oil paintings. Some were made for people who could not afford the time and or money for the lengthy sittings needed for an oil, por an oil portrait, and some were for his own amusement. He was equally facile with pencil, pastel, and charcoal. He worked very quickly, rarely spending more than two hours on a portrait drawing, so he did not, if so, if he did not like the results, he would simply start over. Here, Sargent is experimenting with the side of the pencil lead, which picks up the texture of the paper. The effect is soft and delicate, which seems entirely appropriate for this woman's face. Notice her slightly parted lips and the eyes shyly half closed. This is clearly one of the many studies he did of the portrait of Amélie Gautreaux. He was determined to get the profile of her distinctive face, the slope of her forehead, the shape of her lips and nose and her tender eyes exactly right. Sargent did not do many pastels, but I think this one of Paul Hulu is particularly wonderful. Pastels are un usually done on toned paper so that the warm highlights can be added as we can see in his face. This paper was tan showing in the upper right and lower left. Notice the cigarette in his left hand and the seemingly casual suggestion of Halu's legs which he quickly sketched at the bottom of the drawing. And this sergeant, in this portrait, Sargent uses mood and atmosphere rather than detailed observation to evoke the personality of his sitter. He did these first four portrait drawings when he was in his 20s. This one, a beautiful charcoal of Dame Ethel Smith, reminds us of, of one of Vermeer's portraits with her mouth, wet lips, big hat, and over the shoulder gaze. Sargent certainly must have known Vermeer's work, which had been rediscovered some years earlier. Again, he was he has subtly captured the personality of this woman. She was a composer and, and a close friend of Sargent's and he asked her to sit on the piano and sing so that he could position himself below her eye level. This is an example of his mature style. He was now 45. Charcoal was the preferred medium of the portrait drawings he was selling. 
Sargent drew many famous people. He found Yeats to be boastful and pretentious. He wrote, when he sat for me, he wore a velvet coat and a huge loose bow tie and a long lock of hair fell across his brow. He told me that he did these things to remind himself of his own importance as an artist. We can tell very little about Yeats's personality as so much of the face is in deep shadow. But this was intentional as Sar on Sargent's part as Yeats was certainly not one of his favorite subjects. Still, this is a powerful drawing. And this terrific charcoal is of the male ba ballet dancer Nijinsky who is performing as a woman. The drawing is so dramatic with its intensely dark background and the heavily made out face and long neck. Again, Sargent is looking up at the sitter. In dramatic contrast with Yeats, we can clearly see the details of the eyes, the nose and the mouth, the three most important and challenging elements of any face. The year he did this portrait of Mrs. Sears was the year he finally sold Madame X to the Metropolitan Museum and clearly he had Amélie Gautreau in his mind. In my opinion, Mrs. Sears is more beautiful. I love Sargent's treatment of her hair, her neck, and the bold strokes of her right sleeve. Here's a charming pencil drawing of Yasha Heifetz as a young man. Sargent has beautifully captured his graceful hands and his eyes with his eyes closed in rapture. You can see the head of the violin coming out of the left hand, but we are left to imagine the body of the violin. And he's also left out the bow so that we can see Yasha's mouth. This might have been a study for a painting. The round format is intriguing. The methodical hatching going from upper right to lower left clearly indicates that Sargent was right-handed. Sargent drew this portrait in the 60s. The portrait drawings, which he called mugs, are often overlooked in favor of his wonderful oil portraits, but 50 were exhibited in London in 1916, and the critic Claude Phillips called them swift transcripts of bright youth, saddened maturity, and resigned age, which taken as a whole show the most attractive side of his wonderful talent. The next time you are at Fololi, be sure to check out Sargent's wonderful portraits of Mr. and Mrs. Bourne. So far, we have focused on Sargent's society portraits. Now we're going to Venice. Sargent once described a stay in Venice as a sort of fountain of youth, and he re returned to it to take its waters nine times, creating more than 150 watercolors and oils of this magic city. He was fluent in Italian and knew the canals and the Venetians in a way few tourists experienced them. This remarkable oil painting is only 26 by 30, and yet Sargent was able to give each of these three women distinct personalities. I love the depth and mystery and the drama which he gave this dark Venetian interior, with the sunlight splashing on the shiny stone floor from an opening in the left wall. Speaking from experience, it's easier to paint foliage with its soft edges than to draw it, and it's easier to draw architecture with its complex, sharp edges than to paint it, which makes Sargent's Venice paintings all the more remarkable. I love the reflected light on the right edge of the center column of this oil painting and the shadows bending around it. With supreme confidence, he has beautifully rendered the architectural details with perfect perspective. I love the small triangle of blue sky in the upper left and the complexities of the fishing boat in the foreground. This wonderful painting is also at the De Young, in the De Young Museum's collection. The complex spatial effect is so dramatic, as is the scale change with a delicate fountain in the background on the left. Almost all the light falling on the architecture is reflected light, with a rich variety of warm tones con contrasting with the deep greens of the foliage. I love the negative spaces of the sky. His ability to depict architectural detail is absolutely uncanny. And then there is this lovely little painting, only 13 by 19 inches, which looks more like a Van Gogh or a Monet with its thick paint and colors mixing on the canvas. 
with supreme confidence. The water is mostly happy accidents. And now for Sargent's watercolors. As I mentioned, he painted more than 2,000 of them in his long career, roving from the English countryside to Venice, to Tyrol, to Corfu, Morocco, Spain, the Middle East, Montana, Maine, and Florida. Even when he was escaping the pressures of the portrait studio, he painted with relentless intensity, often working from morning until night. He most often painted Venice, as it is seen from a gondola, moored alongside the hubbub of a piazzetta. He is able to capture this complex scene with perfect perspective and simple strokes of his brush. He deftly paints the reflections shimmering in the canal. The confidence with which he tackles the complexity of the architecture of San Salute in this watercolor is breathtaking. With just the right amount of detail to suggest the statuary and Corinthian columns, the white marble facade is offset by the richness of the colors in the foreground. Never mind that we are left to interpret a lot of random colored squiggles. Notice the delicate Gothic windows to the right of the church. Many of the fine white lines are scratches in the paper. This one has such a fresh and sunny palette. I like the blue shadows dashed across the white boat, the rusty stains from the anchor chain and the flecks of sunlight reflected in the blue shadow. This wonderful photo shows Sargent's remarkable commitment to planing a painting en plein air. Here we have two shade umbrellas, a special easel, a collapsible chair and side table, hiking boots and a hat. This setup looks complicated and he does not look particularly comfortable with his feet braced on some rocks, but, we, but he had learned to work very rapidly. Sargent painted numerous watercolors of the villas around Florence where he had spent many hours as a child. I find this one of a fountain to be particularly beautiful. Like so many of his watercolors, it is about sunlight, shade, cast shadow, and reflected light. Look at the colors he has captured on the underside of the basin and the details of the ram's heads on the upper basin and the richness of the dark green cypress in contrast with the stone of the fountain. Look at the loose, uncontrolled wet pigments running together in the lower right in contrast with the precision of the shadows in the base of the fountain. This tour de force and architectural detail is really remarkable. Again, as he had done in, as he does in his portraits, Sargent has an uncanny ability to combine loose, notice the area under the strong white horizontal band, with tight, notice the beautiful shield with the two eagle heads, wings spread over it in the center. I also love the colors of the purple shadows and the ochre shade tones and the drama of the very dark tones on the left and right edges. Nothing of beauty escapes Sargent's eye and brush. The richness and intensity of the warm pomegranate colors with the deep red seeds against the blue green of the leaves is wonderful. The roundness of the fruit is tangible. The composition of the orbs gives the image great depth. I love the modern look of this one with the, dying, with the drying linens going off the page to the right, the play of negative spaces, the abstract shapes of the cool blue sheets in the shade and the cast shadows zigzagging back and, zigzagging back and forth, drawing us into the picture. The careful control of the hanging laundry con contrast with the lively handling of the foliage with its squiggles and dabs of bright pigment bordering on pure abstraction. Portraits and watercolors have come to be known as opposite ends of Sargent's brilliant oeuvre. Watercolor is a particularly unforgiving medium for portraits, yet when he used, water, when he used watercolors for a portrait, the results were terrific. In this one, as usual, he has achieved a compelling balance between definition and vagueness. The tramp's beard is a transparent blue wash. Sargent has used numerous layers of loose, rich green and brown wash in the background to contrast with the delicate warm skin tones and the brilliant white pinprick 
reflections in the penetrating eyes of the sitter. In 1904, Sargent made an extended trip to the Middle East and was particularly drawn to the Bedouin culture. This was featured in the much praised painting in a, uh, in a, a solo exhibition of watercolors at the Carfax Gallery in London in 1908. One su critic suggested that in these works, Sargent has overcome the tendency of his visual mastery to shunt back the deeper springs of emotion. A human interest is here engaged in the figures of a Western reality stand before us steeped in fierce sunshine. It is hard to forget the stare of these two Bedouins. I particularly like the woman whose face is mostly covered and look at the looseness with which he has painted their garments and the intensity of the blue is wonderful. This watercolor leads us to wonder about the relationship between these two women, the right one gazing at the other, the left one looking a little bit embarrassed. Could this be a woman looking back at her youth? The rich green foliage suggests a whole other world beyond the doorway. Let's go in for a closer look. Notice the, notice the delicacy with which he has painted her face compared to the rough texture of the wall behind her which is in reality, the texture of the paper. It's interesting that he painted the face over the wall texture. Look how easily he is able to capture her clasped hands. As we mentioned earlier, Sargent never intended to exhibit or sell his watercolors in America. And it was only after the continual prodding from a longtime American friend, Edward Boat the father of the four daughters in the wonderful portrait we saw earlier, did he finally agree to a show. It was, understood, it was understood that the watercolors would not be for sale. It was not that Sargent considered his watercolors to be inferior. He knew they were good. It was just that the logistics and risks of shipment from London to the US had seemed too much of a bother, and he certainly did not need the money. In 1909, 86 watercolors were displayed first in New York and then in Boston. The shows were a sensation with critics comments like, only a man of genius could have done this. And they carry you off your feet, unquote. The sergeant decided that he would consider selling the paintings as a group to a museum. And while a show was in New York, the Brooklyn Institute of Arts and Sciences, now the Brooklyn Museum, immediately made him an offer of 20,000 or half a million in today's dollars, which he accepted. 8,000 people attended the 16 day run in Boston. That a critic, Evan Chartres put it nicely, to live with Sargent's watercolors is to live with sunshine captured and held with a luster of a bright and legible world. That same year, a suite of 48 water lilies by Sargent's old friend, Claude Monet were exhibited in Paris for the for the first time. During the last decade of his life, Sargent traveled widely in the US doing watercolors in Montana, Maine, and Florida, indulging in his earliest artistic inclinations for noble mountain landscapes and flora and fauna of all kinds. This one was a diversion from the frustrations of a portrait in progress of J.D. Rockefeller at his home in Ormond Beach, Florida. Rockefeller was the kind of exception he made after he closed his portrait studio. He did a number of sketches for this watercolor, but ultimately it's a stunningly beautiful study of light and shadow on sun-drenched forms. It is fascinating to imagine Sargent set up in front of this writhing, menacing mass of serpentine creatures with their sawtooth pelts. I don't imagine his subjects were willing to hold a pose for more than a minute or two, so my guess is that he used a photograph as an aid for this one. I can't finish Sargent's story without touching on his murals. As you remember, in his early 30s, he received a commission to paint the murals for the new Boston Public Library, which was then under construction. They are so different than anything we have seen so far that it was difficult for me to include them in his show. However, they were very important to Sargent, who spent 29 years on this ambitious mural cycle. They were entitled The Triumph of Religion. Painted in his studio in England and installed over four phases, the panels interpret moments in the history of paganism, 
Judaism, and Christianity. Sargent was fascinated with religious iconography and the murals are packed with symbols of all kinds. They are stunning in their intensity and complexity. Sargent was disappointed by the lukewarm response of the critics. These murals have recently been restored to their original brilliance. The brutality of the war to end all wars was an unprecedented shock to the world. In May of 1918, the British Prime Minister Lloyd George were requested that Sargent travel to the front as an official war artist. His assignment was to, to paint a large canvas memorializing the joint efforts of the English and American troops. The result was this stunningly poignant and complicated mural illustrating the horrors of war with the blind leading the blind. This freeze-like composition, the figures silhouetted against an empty yellow sky, monumentalizes the common soldier without a hint of sentimentality. This dramatic oil painting with a very limited palette of colors is 20 feet long. Let's go in for a closer look at the right half of this extraordinary painting. Notice the interesting negative spaces between the soldiers. Look at the blinded soldier high-stepping onto the boardwalk entrance to the hospital tent indicated by the angled parallel ropes on the right side of the image. There's a second smaller group giving a sense of depth and the sun rises slowly in the haze between the two groups and a flock of birds looks down on this tragic scene of man's brutality to man. As it was his practice, Sargent did many studies in charcoal, watercolor, and oil for this mural. After com completing yet another mural, this time for the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, he commented to a friend, now the American things are done, so I suppose I may die when I like. Three days before he was to sail to Boston to oversee the final installation, April 14th, 1925, he suffered a heart attack in his sleep and died at age 69. He was outlived, outlived by his friend Monet, who died the following year at 86. He's buried in a modest grave in the Brookwood Cemetery in Surrey, England. After his death, he was given a retrospective shows in Boston, New York, and London, but the art critics of the world had fallen in love with Picasso and the new wave of abstract and abstract artists. It's hard to imagine, but at Sargent's death, he was dismissed by many critics as old fashioned and stodgy, merely a skillful illustrator. He did not regain favor until 1950 when a huge retrospective was mounted in New York. Let's have one last look at Amélie Gautreau, which I recently saw again at the Met. As a reminder, he painted this when he was only 27. He displayed it in his studio for 32 years before he sold it to the Met, and he considered it to be one of the best paintings he had ever done. Three other portraits in this show are in the same room at the Met. The great art critic Robert Hughes praised Sargent as the unrivaled recorder of male power and female beauty in a day that, like ours, paid excessive court to both. But I have tried to show you that this ex the extraordinary gift of this complicated, exuberant, and passionate artist went far beyond the beautiful portraits. Henry James said, a man made in his rem re and remembered in his 20s, John Singer Sargent went beyond the bounds of his time to produce the cultured visions reflected in his portraits. It's artists like him that will continue to inspire all audiences and artists alike through the, his passion and the un and unmistakable talent." Unquote. I hope the next time you are at the Met or at the De Young, you will seek out the Sargent paintings and see them with fresh eyes. Thank you. I'm taking the liberty of showing you three of my own paintings so that you can see how Sargent has affected my style. I have, I have painted a few portraits, but I'm primarily a landscape painter. I love this scene of the mountains behind Palm Springs with the dramatic clouds sweeping across the rugged mountains, a little snow on the distant peaks in January. 
Like Sargent, I have tried to keep it as loose as possible using my biggest brushes, but adding the detail of the palm trees and silhouette with my smallest brush. When we got back from Africa in 2008, I felt compelled to do portraits of our beautiful fellow mammals. Again, detail, again, detail where I needed it, the eyes, the ears, the stripes, the suggestion of a few branches, and my biggest brushes where I didn't. And finally, this is where I live, in the Redwood Forest here in Woodside. I too am fascinated by negative spaces. In this one, the brilliant green foliage between the trunks of the trees. My website's easy to remember, jimcaldwellart.com. Thank you again. Wow, Jim, thank you for an amazing evening. Uh, Sargent is certainly uh, an incredible artist. And, um, you know, he did two presidents. He did Teddy Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson. He was also uh, famous for his uh, three paintings that he did of Robert Louis Stevenson. So there's a lot of um, connections to the United States. Um, we, we have some, some questions here for you. Uh, one is, um, as an accomplished architect and artist, what is your preferred BDM for architectural paintings and why? Uh, that's a, a good question. I, um, I, I just paint in oils. I, uh, as an architect, I, I paint one hour early every morning from seven to eight every day uh, that I'm home. That's try, I try to paint seven days a week. So I, 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 uh, there, there are other things I would like to do. And maybe when I retire from architecture, I might take up pastels or, uh, and, and draw more and maybe even try watercolors again. I have, I, I've done some watercolors when I travel, but, but mainly I, I paint in oil and, um, and it's, it's a challenge to do architecture. The, my most recent painting is of Telegraph Hill in the city, of, uh, in the city and I'm drawing uh, buildings and, and they have to be square. And, and so it, that's a challenge. So um, looking at Sargent's work when it comes to portraiture, it's interesting that uh, some portraits um, that he did are basically uh, the upper body, but most of his portraits are the full extension of the individual that he's uh, painting. Do you have any insight as to why he would choose one or the other? Well, I think that the uh, he he fell into this full length portrait pretty early, and uh, and it's so dramatic because he gets to um, he gets to revel in the the dress of the sitter and the fabrics, and and as I showed you in that earlier one uh, where he. Um, he, he just loves to um, get into the fabrics with his biggest brush and create the, this, his genius of being able to create the stunning effect of fabric with his biggest brushes and not to get fussy. And, and it's particularly, and so the full length portrait is, is the most dramatic. And, um, and he obviously he painted fast and he, so he could, could do that. Um, in, in the gallery of the de Young, I hope that a lot of you have already been there. And if you haven't, I hope you will. The de Young is kind of confusing, but it's in the second floor, sort of in the middle. Um, <clears throat> there are some other full length portraits and, and they, they really suffer by comparison. I mean, it's Charlotte Bouchard, I mean, uh, Carolyn um, Bassano, I think her name is, um, you know, is, is, is not a, one of his famous portraits, but it is a gorgeous portrait and it's, and it's so dramatic next to the other full length portraits in the room, because it is so much better in my opinion. So um, we also have a question here. Um, uh, Joan Wilson was wondering that she noticed that many of the profiles of women are similar to that of Madame X. Um, yes, he didn't do a lot of pro profiles. I, I mean, yeah, he did uh, some and, uh, and the profile was certainly an unusual, uh, pose at the time. Um, so um, I, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but um, I um, maybe they need to elaborate on the question a little bit. Um, I, I do want to um, 
touch on the fate of Amelie Gautreau, for those of you who are hanging in here with us, um, who, who really was devastated and, and sadly decided she would try to resuscitate her, her reputation with a, a portrait done by someone else um, much more conventional than, than Sargent. And, uh, and the critics didn't like that one either. And, and then she did a, a yet a third one and she, you know, she died as a recluse hating her face and um, she died quite young and it was a very sad ending to, uh, you, know, you know, I'm sure was a, a, a lovely person and Sergeant's, uh, Sergeant, I think, regretted that, you know, that he had done that to her. Well, he, he did say that every time he does a portrait, he loses a friend. Yeah, well, <laughs> and that that is that's one of the reasons that he finally decided to stop doing portraits because they were difficult and the, his sitters usually expected him to make them look twenty years younger or whatever, and um, and that wasn't the case. But but we as as not knowing these people love to look at them, and there's a there's a whole room full of his portraits in, in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, which is also worth a special detour. Yeah, some, uh, another person has suggested that they said, I think the version of Madame X with the strap off the shoulder is a much more compelling portrait. What do you think? Well, I, yeah, yes, and, but it, it's, interest, it's interesting that when the when the mother, the mother was totally outraged and said, you have to take this out of this, you have to take this out of the salon and, and, and repaint the shoulder strap. This is scandalous. You ruined my daughter. And, um, and, and, the, and the people of the salon said, sorry, you, there's, you can't touch these paintings until the end of the salon. And so he, the, it was there for the entire length of the show. And then when he, he, he when he got the portrait back, he, you know, as, as, as a good sport, he repainted the shoulder strap, but clearly it's, it's a very, it's a very alluring thing to, and that's why Sergeant, you know, when he saw it, he said, this is it. This is, a, you know, I'm going to do this. I leave it. Well, you, it's, it's very difficult, I think, for an artist to uh, be told how to paint. Yes, I'll say, definitely. And uh, and I I I paint whatever I you know pe people would like it if I just painted oaks on rolling golden hills. But when I uh, but when I go when I travel and I, I when I went to to uh, Tahiti I painted Tahiti for a couple of months. And when I got back from Africa I painted African animals. So. Well, I think that kind of uh, sums up um, perhaps your philosophy and, and that of this evening. Um, when uh, Keith Haring, a wonderful artist said, the best reason to paint is there is no reason to paint. <laughs> yeah. So I, I wanna thank you um, again, Jim. I wanna apologize to the audience for not being there at the, at the beginning. And to remind you that this is uh, all sponsored by the Woodside Arts and Culture, which is a committee of volunteers here to support our community. And we do these events every first Friday of the month. And next month, December, we have an exciting musical um, program for you with uh, Jaeger and Reed, who have performed for us many times. And uh, we hope that you will tune in to enjoy that presentation. Um, otherwise, keep safe and take care. Tom, uh, do, do you want to also mention that um, that this has been recorded and they they could they can can they forward the recording to a friend who missed it or yes it will be available on uh, YouTube and that will be posted on our website um, shortly. Okay, thanks, Tom. All right, thank you again, Jim. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. All right. See you have a good time. evening, everyone. Bye-bye.